Hall. Welcome back to General Pharmacology. Let's move to the PowerPoint slides and get started today. We have plenty to talk about. The autocoids, yeah, that's spelled with an A. Some people spell that with an O, and, and that's okay, but officially it's spelled with an A. The autocoid self-healing. That's what these mean. And so histamine, serotonin, the ergot alkaloid, prostaglandins, which is an icosanoid, is the subject today. I was talking to the dental hygiene accreditors, and they were asking me, it was a long time ago, and they, they asked me, what are you lecturing about today? And I said, oh, histamine, serotonin, the ergot alkaloids, and prostaglandins and acosanoids, and, the, and they give me this blank look uh, like it's time to change the subject. And so I used to start section three with this lecture uh, because of histamine and serotonin. So again, uh, we talked about histamine and serotonin in the previous central nervous system lectures. Make sure that you understand a little bit about how those are metabolized as we go through this, and we'll try to make this very simple. All right, histamine, serotonin, the endogenous peptides, uh, prostaglandin, prostaglandins, leukotriene, cytokines, there's all sorts of interesting chemicals in the body that we call autocoids uh, or autocoids. And it just means self-healing, self-remedy in Greek. All right, so histamine and serotonin are biologically active amines. We talked about amino acid-based neurotransmitters in 2.1 neurotransmission, and all of those are biologically active amines. Well, if you think about it, you have lots of amino acids in your body, and specifically, we, we use 20, and all of these can be rearranged in such a way that can mimic neurotransmitters. And so we talked about a basic group of neurotransmitters which are relevant from a clinical pharmacology point of view, but when we start thinking about how the body works, uh, we realize very quickly it gets more ridiculously complicated. And so histamine serotonin are these biologically active amines. They function as neurotransmitters, but they also are used in local regulation and tissues that are not related to uh, the nervous system, non-neural tissues. We start out by talking about histamine. Yes, histamine is a neurotransmitter. It's down at the bottom, histamine is a neurotransmitter that plays an important role in gastric acid secretion. And so when we talk about gastrointestinal pharmacology, we'll talk about H2 blockers. That H stands for histamine receptor type 2 because it is a neurotransmitter. But histamine is more famously known as an important mediator of allergic reaction, immediate allergic reaction, and inflammatory reaction. So when uh, I get bit by a mosquito, and it starts to get inflamed, histamine mediates that reaction. So histamine is formed from the amino acid histidine, and histamine functions as a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator. I think my slides are out of order. Histamine also plays an important role in chemotaxis of white blood cells. Chemo as in chemical taxis, as in to feel, as in to move. And so histamine attracts white blood cells. That's what this slide is trying to say. So when it's functioning as a neurotransmitter, it functions in a nice little synapse, uh, but histamine is also released from mast cells locally to attract white blood cells. So basically same, same chemicals, same neurotransmitter, but different functions. So the immunologic pro processes, the allergic reactions, account for the most important pathophysiologic mechanism of mast cell and basophil histamine release. So later we will talk about immunology and hematology, and we'll talk about a specific type of white blood cell, a type of granulocyte, and they'll be called basophils, baso as in basic fill, as in to like philia. And they're called basophils because they dye blue when you do the right GIMSA stain with them. And a form of basophil mast cells, they have little granules of histamine in them, and when those mast cells are stimulated, when the basophils are stimulated, they release histamine that then mediates the inflammatory reaction. So basophils and mast cells release histamine explosively when antigens come in contact with the cell's IgE antibodies. And so again, we're gonna talk about this with immunology, but this is how the histamine-mediated part of an allergic reaction begins. Uh, the degranulation of mast cells and basophils requires calcium. When we release the vesicles from the synapsis to release neurotransmitter, calcium is required for that vesicle release. 
And the same thing inside of a, of a white blood cell. When it, releases a, when it releases its vesicles full of histamine and other oxidants, other mediators, uh, it requires calcium as well. Histamine can also be released by damaged tissues. Uh, histamine causes vasodilation, opening of the small blood vessels and capillary leakage. And yeah, on a small scale, this allows plasma immune mediators to enter the area. This allows white blood cells to get out of the, the blood vessels and into the peripheral tissue to help fight whatever it thinks it's fighting. However, vasoconstriction, your capillaries on, for the most part, need to be closed uh, a majority of the time, that's what gives your body systemic vascular resistance, which then contributes to you having this thing called blood pressure. And so when histamine is released in the entire body, and an enormous amount of histamine released to the entire body, and the body, uh, all the capillaries completely vasodilate, then you have no systemic vascular resistance. And if you have no systemic vascular resistance, you have no blood pressure. And so histamine can lead to anaphylactic shock. Uh, and shock in the medical business is not a psychological thing. Shock is a complete loss of blood pressure. Histamine is also chemotactic, meaning it attracts other white blood cells to the area. Histamine and its neural action, it's a powerful stimulant of sensory nerve endings, especially those that mediate pain and itching. So when the mosquito bites me and I start scratching on it, which only makes things worse, that's because histamine is stimulating those nerves, uh, causing the pain and the itching. Histamine causes vasodilation and lowers blood pressure. Eventually we'll get to the point. Uh, histamine causes bronchoconstriction. This is a problem in asthmatics. Bronco as in lung airways, constriction as to close. And this, this happens because around the the little bronchial tubes are smooth muscles that open and close the lung airways. And so when those smooth muscles uh, contract, that causes bronchoconstriction. So people with asthma are especially, a sens especially sensitive to histamine. And so when they have some kind of allergic reaction, usually manifests itself as, uh, in, as an asthmatic attack. And, and we're going to talk about asthma in the next lecture. Histamine activates specific cellular receptors on surface membranes. We know of four types of histamine receptors. We'll talk about these two in pharmacology. H1 receptors are found on the smooth muscle and endothelium. They have to do with allergic reactions. Endothelium, the inner lining of your blood vessels. And so H1 receptors are what's involved in bronchoconstriction and opening up uh, capillary uh, beds to allow for chemotaxis. H2 is found in the stomach lining and stimulates acid secretion. And so when we talk about H2 blockers in GI pharmacology, that H doesn't stand for acid. That H stands for histamine receptor type 2. And that's an important thing to keep in mind because a lot of people get that confused and they ask board questions about it. And I. There are H3 receptors and H4 receptors. I'll let you guys read about those. We don't talk about those much in clinical pharmacology. Uh, histamine causes contraction of the intestinal smooth muscle and causes secretion of stomach acid. And the the, something interesting to talk about is something called scombroid poisoning. I was working in a clinic one day and my partner asked me, well, gee, do you talk about scombroid poisoning? Because that's a great way to describe the effects of histamine. So scombroid poisoning, the principal agent is histamine. There's some other things biologically active amines involved as well. Uh, but this tells us, uh, gives us an indication of what histamine does systemically in the body. All right, scombroid poisoning is usually due to uh, some kind of contaminated fish. Uh, that gets very complicated to read about uh, which, which fish are involved. Uh, ichthyotoxicosis, that's an interesting word to say. And so when somebody eats this fish, it usually has this peppery taste. Uh, it doesn't taste like fresh fish like we're used to. Uh, but they can develop a scombroid poisoning, scombroid toxicity. It's usually self-limiting, but it can cause significant discomfort. Uh, 
And so when they consume this toxic fish that has histamine poisoning in it, uh, it can take 10 to 30 minutes for the symptoms to begin. And their symptoms are flushing, which is redness due to vasodilation, palpitations, jumping in the heart, headache, nausea, diarrhea, anxiety. Prostration is just severe exhaustion. They can have problems with their vision, uh, diffuse macular blanching erythema, a uh, type of allergic reaction on the skin, fast heart rate, wheezing, and either hypotension or hypertension depending on the reflex of the body. And so the direct effect of the histamine is hypotension, except early in the direct effect, the body can respond by speeding up the sympathetic nervous system. And so sometimes a hypertension is the first sign uh, before the body gives up and then we end up with hypotension and even shock. We do not use histamine as a drug except for in rare situations during pulmonary function tests. Pulmonary function test is to test the lungs function and they give us a pattern that basically tells us do they have an obstructive pattern, do they have a restrictive pattern, and it gives us a good sign of what type of pathophysiology is going on with the lungs. And sometimes we can give the patient histamine during a pulmonary function test to make their pulmonary function testing worse so that then we know that they are very sensitive to histamine. I don't hear this talked about much. The other way I know histamine is used as a drug is with allergy testing. When you get an allergy test, they'll uh, give you teeny, teeny, tiny little um, just dermal pinpricks of different antigens and then the control they use to make sure that you're even able to have an allergic reaction. They'll give you a little control with histamine and the uh, histamine will um, uh, be that control on an allergy test. And so that's, that's something Katsung left out of his book, at least the last time I looked at Katsung's book. Uh, but bottom line, we don't use histamine as a drug. But we have all sorts of drugs out there that are histamine antagonists. Some of our H2 blockers, others are antihistamines. Please do not call H2 blockers antihistamines. That might be technically correct from a strictly literal point of view, but from a clinical pharmacology point of view, it's the H1 blockers we call antihistamines. The H2 blockers, we call H2 blockers. All right. Histamine actions are the opposite of epinephrine. Remember, epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor, uh, and that raises blood pressure. Histamine is a vasodilator, and somebody having a severe allergic reaction can have anaphylactic shock because of complete loss of systemic vascular resistance due to vasodilation mediated by histamine. So even though they don't compete over the same receptors, Histamine and epinephrine have completely opposite effects. That's why when somebody having an allergic reaction, they can carry an epinephrine pen, an EpiPen, to help offset the effect of histamine. And so those are called physiologic antagonists. Epinephrine is the physiologic antagonist of his histamine. And I know we talked about that in 1.3. So there's all sorts of histamine antagonists out there that have all sorts of clinical usefulness. The H1 antagonists are called the antihistamines. The H2 antagonists are called H2 blockers. Please do not confuse these because they're different types of receptors. H2 blockers aren't very good at allergy symptoms, and these H1 antagonists aren't very good at preventing stomach acid secretion, I assure you. All right, so antihistamines exert their anti-allergy properties by blocking the peripheral H1 receptor in the body. However, many of the antihistamine, many of the actions of antihistamines have nothing to do with peripheral H1 receptor blockade. And this is why we used to start central nervous system pharmacology this way, because I wanted you to see the complexity of how very simple things uh, like histidine being, conform, can, being transformed into histamine can have all sorts of effects, especially on the brain. So a lot of these effects are due to histamine receptors in the central nervous system or receptors in the central nervous system that respond to histamine. And we can have sedation and anxiolytic effects, uh, 
diphenhydramine Benadryl was one of the first drugs to show uh, serotonin reuptake inhibition and its anxiolytic effects. The antihistamines can also be used for nausea and motion sickness. Uh, we talked about in Parkinson's disease using Benadryl diphenhydramine as an anti-Parkinsonian agent because diphenhydramine also has anticholinergic effects. And none of these are due to peripheral H1 antagonists. It's peripheral, like operating on the organs, operating on the blood vessels, operating on the white blood cells in the skin, and uh, the stomach acid secretion, that's all peripheral. However, some of the older antihistamines, the older antihistamines, also have central nervous effects, and that's why they have all sorts of mixed actions that's listed here. So you look at one drug guide, and diphenhydramine will be listed as uh, an antihistamine, and maybe you'll see that it also has a sedative hypnotic effect, uh, maybe something else. Maybe you'll meet somebody who uses these types of antihistamines as anxiolytics. Uh, that's not uncommon. Many of the antihistamines have anti-nausea properties and will be used in motion sickness as well. The antihistamines have serotonin reuptake effects as well as other serotonin receptor issues, uh, actions. There's lots of different serotonin subtypes in the brain, lots of serotonin receptor subtypes in the brain. In 2.1 and 2.2, we made it real simple. Acetylcholine has nicotinic and muscarinic. And the catecholamines, they have alpha and beta, and it's slightly more complicated than that. All of it's more complicated than that. When we talk about serotonin, there's so many subtypes in the brain, it's really difficult to even begin trying to memorize where they are and what they do. And so the first thing I wanted you to see about the old antihistamines, the H1 antagonists, they have all sorts of mixed actions, so they have all sorts of interesting uses. Like diphenhydramine Benadryl, it is an excellent anti-allergy drug. However, if you go and to a different section of the pharmacy and look for diphenhydramine as a sedative and a sleep aid, a hypnotic, you can get exactly the dif same diphenhydramine that's labeled as a sleep aid. You can actually pay significantly less money for it because it's not a great sedative. So 25 milligrams of diphenhydramine as a sedative will cost you much less than 25 milligrams of diphenhydramine as an anti-allergy agent. And the difference between the drugs is zero. We also use diphenhydramine as an anti-Parkinsonian agent because diphenhydramine, Benadryl, even though it is an antihistamine with H1 antagonism, has all sorts of central nervous effects, it has serotonin effects in the central nervous system, and it has anticholinergic effects in the central nervous system as well. Hydroxyzine is Atarax. It's an antihistamine, an H1 antagonist, and it is excellent for itching. Whatever the receptor, specific subtype of receptor that's responsible for itching, Atarax hydroxyzine is excellent for that. And so if somebody has an allergic reaction, some kind of contact dermatitis, some kind of allergic reaction to the skin, Benadryl is not helping them with their itching, hydroxyzine Atarax is excellent as an antihistamine for that. Something we used to do in the large inner city clinics that I used to work in long ago is try to get people off of benzodiazepines that are very addictive. And back before the days where we had a lot, we didn't really have a lot of serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We didn't really have a lot of choices back then. It was like Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft. Uh, those were the, basically the choices of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, certainly not the collection of mood altering substances that we have today. And so when somebody was using Valium or another benzodiazepine, especially if they're getting it on the street, uh, we tried to convince them that this worked really well for anxiety. And the reason we tried to convince them of that is because it does work really well for anxiety. And so hydroxyzine, an H1 antagonist, Atarax, we used to, we used to tell them that was kind of a, a substitute for Valium and many people, they did really well with it because it has an anxiolytic effect and then there's also the placebo effect where uh, they're gonna get an effect from the medication because they're gonna believe they have an effect of the medication and that's one of the most important parts of pharmacology is their buy-in. You know, if they're not buying in, then they're not gonna get a placebo effect. They're certainly not gonna get the same effect otherwise.
And so we used to use hydroxyzine Atarax regularly to get people off of benzodiazepines. And really, a lot of people did really well with it until the age came where people started to explain to them, well, that's, that's not an anxiolytic. It's, it's an antihistamine. It's for itching. And so I had a lot of patients who did really well with hydroxyzine Atarax as an anxiolytic come back in and say, what, what are you giving me this for, for anxiety for? It's an anti-itch drug. It's not for anxiety. And so, you know, be careful about being really specific about a labeled use and the clinical descriptions that are in certain drug guides because there are plenty of people out there who have been successfully managed with their anxiety using hydroxyzine Atarax. Uh, but nowadays there's a lot of different medications that we can use instead, so we see less of that. Uh, but don't be surprised if it's still going on out there. All right, meclizine is bonine. Um, it's the same thing as anavert. Anavert is used for vertigo. Vertigo is the sensation of movement. Be careful using the word dizzy. Um, when you get lightheaded and you're about to pass out, that's a different form of dizziness than feeling the room spin. Uh, I have a nice spinny chair, but I don't have enough room to spin in a circle to make myself dizzy to where I sense movement going on even though I'm sitting perfectly still. And so that's what vertigo is. So be careful using the word dizziness in the clinical setting because there's basically two types. There's that lightheadedness that happens right before you pass out. That's called presyncope. Uh, but that lightheadedness is usually due to some vascular issue or some metabolic issue. Vertigo, spin dizzying, usually has something to do with what's going on in between your middle ear and the parts of your brain that sense that. And so meclizine bonine is excellent for vertigo. We can take a, a larger dose of that. They call it anavert. It's the same meclizine. Well, it's the same bonine that they sell when you go on a boat tour, when you sign up to go on the Pacific Whale Foundation. Uh, maybe they have a little shop there with bonine, or if you go on a dive boat, uh, they'll have a little shop and, and they have bonine for sale, and they'll use it for motion sickness. It works great for motion sickness, however, uh, it also has a sedating effect as well, and so it can make you sleepy while you're on your boat trip. Uh, and if you read the, the drug guide carefully, it'll say, well, it's an antihistamine. And people will, well, if it's, I don't have allergies. I'm like, well, it works for motion sickness as well. Matter of fact, it works great for motion sickness. Acyproheptadine is periactin, and we can use it as an antihistamine, but it also interferes with serotonin production. And so here are older antihistamines are used for their serotonin effects as well. So sure, we can use periactin cyproheptadine for allergic reactions, itching. Cyproheptadine periactin is great for itching. However, the most common reason we'll see cyproheptadine a periactin used in an emergency room situation is something called serotonin syndrome. With all the serotonin drugs out there, it's easy for people to get excessive amounts of serotonin in their synapses get their, uh, their serotonin receptors out of balance, and so we'll use cyproheptadine periactin to treat uh, serotonin syndrome because it interferes with serotonin production and other things going on with serotonin. And so again, the point of this is be careful, and we've talked about this before, be careful, oh, antihistamines, uh, they're used for allergy, and that's fine. However, the antihistamines are used for a lot of other reasons as well because the old H1 antagonists have a lot of mixed actions in the central nervous system. Uh, promethazine is phenergen, and it's based on a phenothiazine, a D2 receptor antagonist, psychotic, but it is also listed as an antihistamine because it has H1 antagonism. And so here we see these drugs that have mixed action in the central nervous system. And so we'll use it for nausea and vomiting, and we'll use it in combination with mepiridine demerol. So demerol is a synthetic um, opiate analgesic, and um, one of the problems with the opiate analgesics is the nausea and vomiting associated associated with it. So in the clinical setting, when we give somebody Demerol for pain, we'll just add Phenergan to it naturally, or just automatically, we'll just give it with Phenergan to prevent the nausea and vomiting caused by the Demerol. However, something to keep in mind, uh, Promethazine Phenergan is a dopamine receptor 2 antagonist. 
And so promethazine phenergan can cause some of the same unwanted effects as the antipsychotic agents. And so if you go back and look at the antipsychotic agents and see some of their unwanted effects, one of them was a dystonic reaction where their muscles will freeze up and their face will contort and we'll need to give them an IV antihistamine very quickly to uh, alleviate those symptoms. All right, well, anything that's a D2 antagonist, uh, even if it's a nausea and vomiting medication, can cause acute dystonic reactions. And so be on the lookout for that because we use mepiridine, Demerol, in the hospital setting quite often, and we always add promethazine, which is Phenergan, with that. And occasionally, you might come across somebody who has an acute dystonic reaction from the promethazine for this reason right here. Uh, something else to know about the promethazine, the phenergen, because it's based on uh, D2 receptor antagonist, it also has mixed actions on alpha receptors, and so this can cause orthostatic hypotension as well. So, you know, it's enough that the Demerol uh, gives them uh, a, an effect uh, of drowsiness, uh, but promethazine increases their risk of falling down as well. And so be careful when you look at these drugs, they'll say, oh, well, it does this. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's one of its effects, but these drugs affect many organs and the central nervous system and different uh, many receptors in the central nervous system. And so we'll see a lot of mixed effects from these medications. So again, because it's, I, I knew I wasn't telling you off the top of the head, uh, because it's based on phenothiazines, uh, we can expect dystonic reactions, sedation, and orthostatic hypotension when we use this medication. So it's very important to be on the lookout for this. Sure, you're going to give plenty of promethazine to people and have no problem with it whatsoever and think that you're not going to have any of these things, uh, but you're not going to recognize these things if you don't keep an eye out for them. And then once you start keeping an eye out for them, uh, you'll see that it happens more often. It's like a word that you've never heard of before. And this happens to me. I try to look up every word that I possibly can if I don't know the definition. And, um, and so you'll notice there'll be this word you've never heard of before and you look at it and you realize, hey, okay, now I know what this word means. And then once you know what the word means, you hear it all the time, like you'd never heard it before and now you have heard of it. And it's this thing in the brain called a scotoma. You have these blind spots in your eye you can't see them because your brain just fools you that they're not there. You can do a little test to find your scotomas uh, if you do that carefully, but your brain has you convinced that you can see everything that you need to see and know everything that you need to know. That's why you don't recognize words that you don't recognize. It's like they're invisible. And then when you learn the word, you start to recognize it and see it. And the same thing goes with pharmacology. If you don't know these things about the drug, you're not going to recognize them and you're not going to attribute them to the drug. And you're going to say, well, gee, I've never seen any of that happen before. And then once you realize that this is the potential from using this medication regularly, uh, you might start to recognize these things when they happen. Well, the nice thing is the newer generation H1 antagonists are much more selective for peripheral H1 blockade. Uh, Allegra, Claritin, and Zyrtec, and uh, there's another one that's missing. Uh, Clarinex is missing from this, and, and that's just a prodrug of, of these. Um, these cause less sedation. Some of these cause no sedation. Everybody's a little bit different, and so we might have uh, some unexpected central nervous system effects from these drugs. But for the most part, uh, these work really well for all sorts of allergic reactions and allergies and they're very specific for H1, peripheral H1 receptors, so we don't expect all that central nervous system stuff that we've just been talking about. Well, then there's the H2 receptor antagonists. We do not call them antihistamines because they have a completely different use, because they have a completely different set of actions than H1 blockers. And Tagamet, Pepsid, Axid, and Zantac, these are H2 blockers. They're used to prevent excess stomach acid secretion. Later, when we talk about gastrointestinal pharmacology, we'll talk about proton pump inhibitors. And if you remember, protons are basically hydrogen ions, which is the active ingredient in acid. And so proton pump inhibitors, those have to do with H that's hydrogen. The H2 blockers have to do with an H that's histamine. And I hear people confuse that all the time, and I see it on board questions, and I, I wonder who writes those board questions anyway.
Let's talk about serotonin. We talked a little bit about serotonin when we talked about the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and we talked a little bit about serotonin when we talked about neurotransmission. So let's talk a little more about serotonin. And, and I used to give this lecture before I gave the central nervous system pharmacology lectures, and so if it, it seems like they're out of order. This is why. All right, when I was studying neuroscience in college, which was my favorite subject at the time, I wanted serotonin to be a neurotransmitter. It's this complex neurotransmitter in the brain. There's all these serotonin subtype receptors or receptor subtypes that I'm going to sit around and memorize never. And I wanted serotonin to be a neurotransmitter. And it is. However, its name, sero blood tonin, tense. Uh, implies that it has vasoconstrictive properties, and when people talk that way, I don't want to hear that. I want to know about serotonin and how it works on the brain and memory and thought and mood. Those are the things that I was interested in. But it turns out that we knew that serotonin 5-hydroxytryptamine is a vasoconstrictor, and we knew that first before we knew anything about neurotransmitters. And so we've known for a very long time that when blood clots, this vasoconstrictors will be released from the platelets, and one of those substances is serotonin. And then later, uh, the neuro rocket scientists figured out all the different important receptors that serotonin affects in the central nervous system. Oh, and it's also involved in the gastrointestinal tract and uh, other uh, blood the cerebral vasculature in the dura is sensitive to serotonin, and so its serotonin is especially involved in migraine headaches. We made serotonin out of tryptophan, and you can go back and take a look at 2.1 when we synthesize the neurotransmitters. Take a look at how uh, we go from tryptophan to 5-hydroxytryptamine. And then the 5-hydroxytryptamine is broken down into 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid by monoamine oxidase. And this is important uh, because people who have certain types of tumors that secrete too much serotonin, we're going to collect their urine for 24 hours and look, uh, collect their urine for 24 hours, keep it on ice, and see what their 5-HIAA levels are, their 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid levels. Uh, because that goes up and down over the course of the day. That's why we take it over 24 hours, because then that gives us a baseline. And we don't go looking for serotonin because it's easily metabolized. And so 5-HIAA is a great way to look for carcinoid tumors. And so uh, tumors are cells that grow out of control, and we'll talk about this when we talk about cancer and chemotherapy, but they have defective... Um, they have defective synthesis going on. They have defective cell regulation. And so something tumors can do is make stuff that they're not supposed to make. And so we'll see this in all sorts of different types of tumors. There will be tumors that grow, and they'll start secreting these substances that they're not supposed to make. They wouldn't be making otherwise. And so things that are carcinoid tumors are known for secreting serotonin. I don't know if the 10% is correct. I'm assuming that slide is correct. But carcinoid tumors in general secrete excessive amounts of serotonin. And that serotonin in the body causes flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, abdominal cramping, and peripheral edema. And so we don't use serotonin as a drug, but there are all sorts of serotonin agonist antagonists that we can use. And again, to search for the carcinoid tumor, uh, we look for, uh, to look for evidence of a carcinoid tumor or whether a tumor is carcinoid and causing these symptoms right here, uh, we'll look for 5-HIAA levels. And I think maybe you have a question about that. All right, so there's many, 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 many serotonin receptor subtypes in the brain and many more in the gut and smooth muscles and platelets. And so with acetylcholine, it was very simple in clinical pharmacology. We have muscarinic and we have nicotinic, and then we can divide those into different numbers. Uh, when you talk about serotonin, it gets very, very complicated. And so we don't even try to memorize the different receptor subtypes in this course, because uh, I don't think clinically there's much of a point. And again, we don't use serotonin as a drug. However, there are all sorts of serotonin agonists and antagonists, and they have all sorts of 
interesting clinical uses like buspar. Uh, buspirone, it is a five, it is a serotonin agonist and it's a non-benzodiazepine anxiolytic. And so when I was taking care of nursing home patients, at one time I was the medical director of a nursing home and one of the government regulations at the time was that when elderly patients were on benzodiazepines like Ativan and Valium for anxiety, we needed to trial them on a different medication and this was the medication that they recommended. And so we would routinely try to get patients off the benzodiazepines and onto uh, a different anxiolytic like Buspar. And so Buspar and Buspar is excellent substitute for benzodiazepines for anxiety. It has a pretty good anxiolytic effect and some patients responded great to this medication. Others did not respond so well because everybody's a little bit different. A Buse Bar, on a side note, is also excellent for, um, I've seen this and used this for people with irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is usually associated with anxiety and my anecdotal uh, sentence for this slide is that, that people who have anxiety and have irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, Buspar, I've seen, have excellent results. All right, all the triptans. Assume a triptan was the first uh, triptan, but and there's a long list of triptans. All the triptans are serotonin agonists, and they are used for migraine headaches. And so this specific receptor type is seen in the dural vasculature, and these are excellent for treating uh, migraine headaches, especially if we use them earlier. Uh, we don't use them before, we don't use them preventative, we use them when they're actively having a migraine headache. And there are all sorts of triptans on the market for migraine headache, and I'll take let you take a look at the list. All right, we use serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and we call them antidepressants, uh, however, we can use them for more than depression. We can use them for anxiety. We can use them for obsessive compulsive disorder. We can use them as smoking cessation agents. We can use them in obesity. And in the old days, we used to call them selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, and you still hear that SSRI thrown around. Uh, however, that S at the beginning of serotonin reuptake inhibitor stood for selective. And then we had SNRIs, which stood for serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And people started thinking that S and SNRI stood for selective. And something I want you to know about this lecture is that nothing is really as selective as they, that the word would imply. Uh, selective makes you think, oh, it only works on this and nothing else. And that's not really true at all. And so I don't like, I don't even like the word selective in pharmacology. I'm not the only one because we know that there are mixed actions. And I, I thought an excellent example of this yesterday uh, when I was watching the kids at the beach. And uh, maybe I'll remember next time. So there's all sorts of serotonin reuptake inhibitors on the market. The list is larger than this. And we talked about this when we talked about uh, central nervous system pharmacology and disorders of mood. All right, ondansetron Zofran is a serotonin antagonist. It's used for nausea and vomiting. And I, here it says cancer and chemotherapy. That's how it started. However, we're using Zofran ondansetron for uh, just flu, uh, stomach flu, nausea and vomiting for whatever reason. It's an excellent drug. In the old days, we used to use a lot of uh, rectal suppositories of uh, nausea agents because uh, at the time, anti-nausea drugs uh, that were oral, you had to swallow as a pill, and that would make people throw up and throw up the pill, and so then we started using a lot of suppositories. However, now ondansetron Zofran has a dissolvable, uh, has a dissolvable version uh, where you can put it in your mouth and the drug immediately dissolves and immediately begins working. And so when this drug came out, uh, it was used exclusively for cancer chemotherapy, and I think that's the way the label read uh, the last time that I read it. However, this is an excellent drug in, for nausea and vomiting and motion sickness as well, and uh, it's, uh, it's excellent medication. 
And then there is because the nausea medications have different receptors that they work with, uh, you can mix them carefully, or trained professionals can mix them very carefully where somebody's having uncontrolled nausea and vomiting, uh, we can use uh, ondansetron in combination uh, with a D2 antagonist and get uh, cover all the receptors. And so um, if you're in a cancer a chemotherapy unit, uh, you'll learn plenty about all of that. All right, well, there's all sorts of new serotonin drugs out there. And so then this is an increasing problem, serotonin syndrome. It can be fatal. And it's just due to an imbalance of serotonin regulation in the brain, uh, excess of synaptic serotonin in the synapse. And so with all the drugs out there, we're seeing this more with the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, the migraine triptan drugs, and ondansetron. If you take a look at all the serotonin drugs out there, uh, be on the lookout for the um, package the part of the clinical warning uh, asking you to take a look at asking uh, warning you about serotonin syndrome uh, because we're seeing this more and more there we go um, so serotonin syndrome can present clinically as hypertension uh, and then the body can respond to that with hypotension and so that's why anytime you see hypertension uh, you'll see that or hypotension and that's because there's a direct effect and then there's this reflex effect Hyperreflexia, you tap on their knees with a hammer or uh, the side of your hand when you always lose your hammer. And uh, they'll, 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 their reflexes, hyper high reflexia, their reflexes are excessive. Um, they can have a tremor. Uh, they lose their ability to regulate their temperature, which results in hyperthermia. Your brain does not tolerate temperatures uh, much higher than 105. Once you get to 105 point something, uh, the brain is not able to function at that temperature, and so that's why your body's very careful about regulating its temperature, and it gets uh, higher than 105, uh, then your brain cannot function. And that's uh, one of the reasons it leads to coma. Uh, diarrhea, uh, madriasis is pupil dilation, agitation, um, coma, death. Serotonin syndrome can be treated with benzodiazepines like Valium. However, you also see antihistamines, old antihistamines used to block serotonin um, production. And so we just got through talking about cyproheptidine periactin as an antihistamine, but because of its serotonin effects, uh, we can use it in serotonin syndrome. Let's talk a little bit about the ergot alkaloids. I think the ergot alkaloids are very, very, very interesting. And if you study them carefully, if you spend the time, you know, I'm curious, and so I look up everything. If there's something I don't know about, I'll look it up and realize that the story is much, much, much deeper than what anyone can tell you. And that's, that has to do with everything in humanity. Uh, there are these very, very, very complex situations out there. And people like me try to make it simple, and then people like the media, they try to just boil it down into a simple sentence. And uh, a lot of information is lost when we do that. And so something that's fun to read about is the ergot alkaloids and their history. All right, the ergot alkaloids are produced by a fungus that infects grains. And this fungus, Claviceps purpurea, synthesizes histamine along with all sorts of other interesting things. Acetylcholine, uh, tyramine is an intermediate byproduct of the catecholamines and all sorts of other biologically active products. In addition to a wide range of ergot alkaloids. And one I, first thing I want you to know about the ergot alkaloids is they don't have this specific one ergot, all the ergot alkaloids work on different, each each different ergot alkaloid works on a different set of receptors. So this ergot's not going to be the same as that ergot over there. Uh, this ergot's going to have that effect. That ergot's going to have a completely different effect. And so that's something to keep in mind as we go through the ergots. All right, so if you think about it, in human history, we started out being independent as hun hunters and gatherers. That's the uh, term we use. And then over time, 
uh, we learn to be a more complex society, an agrarian society, where people had different roles. And that started when we were able to farm wheat and rice and other grains. And so because we could grow them and feed communities, then we had to store them. And something that we learned a very hard way uh, from the beginning of history is that these grains will get moldy. And then when we eat these grains, uh, all sorts of bizarre things happen. So these ergot alkaloids along, uh, the ergot alkaloids affect all sorts of different receptors. And so I think there's a question about what type of receptors do the ergot alkaloids affect? And the answer, there's this long list of them at the bottom, it says all of the above. And that's what I want you to know, is that ergot alkaloids, each ergot alkaloid has a specific set of receptors that it can affect. All right, so back what I was talking about, the ingestion of ergot alkaloids from moldy grain can be traced back from the beginning of the development of society. And so when we went from hunters and gatherers to an organized society that relied on farming, then we had to store the grain and then that grain would get moldy in many areas and then people would eat the grain uh, that was moldy, and then they would have all sorts of interesting symptoms, and that was called ergotism. And so uh, the history of ergotism in and of itself is something that I could read and write about uh, plenty, at least until I got bored and wanted to do something else. All right, so eating this moldy grain had different effects on different people depending on what was being manufactured by the fungus in that moldy grain. And so some of the effects would be dementia, uh, a loss of the mind, uh, psychosis, hallucinations. And then people would have some people would have prolonged vasospasm. They'd have such severe vasoconstriction from the uh, alpha-1 properties of the ergotism and the other ergots that it would shut off blood supply causing limbs to become gangrenous and rot. Um, there are spontaneous abortions causing uh, the uterine contraction uh, to expel its contents spontaneously. And so from the beginning of history uh, we had uh, these little demons floating around because of this, and you can only imagine. Or you can just read about all the social chaos, uh, witchcraft, Satanism, uh, that all was associated. All of that was associated with this, and then we realized uh, it was associated with that. And so I would suggest that the ergot alkaloids have had a very profound effect on our belief systems and our social structures uh, in many, 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 many societies today. All right, but now we know that naturally occurring ergot alkaloids have hallucinatory properties. Not all of them, but some of them do. Some of the ergots cause hallucinations. Uh, the guy that was uh, synthesizing uh, a type of ergot alkaloid. He was making a synthetic ergot alkaloid. I think he was trying to make something helpful with sleep because serotonin is uh, a good sleep helper. You'll hear people say, oh, well, if you take serotonin, that'll help you sleep. And so this guy, uh, and I don't remember his name right now, um, but he was trying to make a synthetic sleep agent. And he came up with LSD, and he got a little tiny drop on his hand and hallucinated profoundly. And uh, rather than just give the whole thing up, uh, it turned into its own drug. Don't do LSD. All right, bromocryptine is an ergot alkaloid as well. It doesn't cause hallucinations in the near entirety of people. I'm sure there's overlap in somebody's receptors somewhere. Um, but bromocryptine, even though it's an ergot alkaloid, doesn't cause hallucinations. Even though LSD is an ergot alkaloid, it doesn't have the same effects as bromocryptine. 
Uh, bromocryptine is a dopamine agonist, and we talked about this when we talked about Parkinson's disease, because in Parkinson's disease we want to raise dopamine levels or use dopamine agonists. And so bromocryptine parladel is a great drug to use in Parkinson's disease in many situations. And even though it's listed as an anti-Parkinsonian agent, you'll see it used to treat prolactinomas in women, young women who have tumors of the area of their anterior pituitary that causes them to secrete uh, prolactin and cause them to make breast milk. Uh, we can use bromocryptine parladel to treat that without surgery. And so, again, be careful. Uh, you'll see it listed as an anti-Parkinsonian agent. Uh, don't forget that it's used to treat prolactinoma. And bromocryptine is an ergot alkaloid. All right, because serotonin is a, is a mediator of migraine headaches, um, ergotamine, cafergot, is effective for migraines, but it's especially effective during something called the prodrome, the aura phase. When people have migraine headaches, many of them have a prodrome, a presyndrome. Uh, they're going to have symptoms that occur before the headache begins. And many people's prodromes are very simple. Maybe they see some sparkling lights or maybe tingling in their fingers. Some people's prodromes are profoundly, um, profoundly interesting, uh, for lack of a better word. And so uh, some people have migraines and their prodrome, there's little, the, the symptoms they have before, uh, they might mimic having a major stroke. We talked about the book, uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife, the Man Who Mistook His Wife for Hat by Oliver J. Sacks, which is a great book about basic neurology, interesting uh, things in neurology, interesting stories in neurology. And he has a whole section about uh, prodromes in migraine headache because some people, their prodrome uh, can be uh, seeing all these patterns, seeing visions. Their prodrome can affect their memory. Their, uh, their prodromes have all sorts of profound effects on, on their psyche as well. And so uh, Oliver J. Sacks' book talks about uh, these very interesting prodromes that many people have in migraine headaches. And so when you read a normal book about normal medicine and normal migraines, uh, they'll tell you about the normal prodromes, which is usually, oh, I see sparkling lights or I have tingling in my fingers. However, I used to, I worked with neurologists in neurosurgery and, and I've seen a lot of people have uh, migraine headaches that had very profound prodromes. They're also called the aura phase, uh, where they see something uh, very incredible or sense something very incredible or very simple uh, before their headache. And if we give them uh, the cafergot during that prodrome phase, then it's especially useful. Uh, it's available orally. It's also available as a suppository as well for those people whose prodrome involves uh, nausea and vomiting. Uh, ergotamine caprogot is not so useful uh, once they've had the headache. The longer they've had the migraine headache, uh, the less effective the ergotamine the caprogot is. All right, let's talk about the prostaglandins. All right, pr prostaglandins have all sorts of uses in the body. Um, when we talked about acetylcholine in clinical pharmacology, we said, well, oh, it's in the neuromuscular junction, and then it's used by the parasympathetic nervous system, and then, oh, yeah, it's in the central nervous system as well, and we talked about that uh, with the corpus striatum, um, the basal ganglia. All right, well, prostaglandins are very complicated little structures that have all sorts of very interesting and very uh, complex um, complex effects on the body. Uh, so prostaglandins are lipids. That means they're made of little fatty acids, uh, specifically fatty acids synthesized from arachidonic acid. Uh, so all the prostaglandins are synthesized by arachidonic acid. That's where our story begins. And arachidonic acid has 20 carbons, and so you'll see that 20 carbon fatty acid, arachidonic acid. And so arachidonic acid leads to the prostaglandins, and the prostaglandins have all sorts of interesting self-regulation, self-healing uh, properties. Uh, some of them are not as self-healing as we'd want them to be, uh, but we still list them as autocoids. Uh, 
And so the different prostaglandins have different functions in the body, and just because we call it prostaglandin, now that doesn't mean there's much of a similarity in what they do. All right, so all prostaglandins start life as arachidonic acid, and all the prostaglandins have 20 carbon atoms, which make them icosanoids. And so uh, when we talk about prostaglandins, all the prostaglandins are icosanoids, and icoso just means 20 in Greek. Uh, every prostaglandin has a five carbon ring. Uh, the prostaglandins are not named by uh, a marketing agency at a drug company, and they're not named like the other chemicals as well. They're named with a letter, uh, which tells us something about the ring structure, and then a number, which tells us the number of double bonds. And so that's where all these interesting things come from. Prostaglandin E1 uh, means that that's the E re ring structure. I'm sure somebody can tell me what that E stands for. And then the 1 just means there's one double bond in the lipid chain, so that would make that the unsaturated part of the lipid chain, if you remember from the second lecture. See, I told you there'd be a use for all this stuff. Uh, prostaglandin I2, uh, I'm going to guess that that I stands for indole in this situation, uh, but I could be wrong. And then I, I'm sorry, 2, uh, stands for the number of double bonds in this structure. Uh, those are double bonds with carbons, not the one on the carboxylic acid. All right, so notice there's two double bonds here, and that's how it gets its name I2. I don't expect you to memorize this. I just want you to see uh, where all these names come from uh, because we'll talk about prostaglandin D4 eventually, especially when we talk about asthma. All right, prostaglandins sustain a large number of homeostatic functions and mediate all sorts of pathogenic mechanisms. Only a few of them we'll talk about today, uh, especially inflammatory responses. And so when we talk about prostaglandins in clinical pharmacology, uh, the ones we're going to talk about are part of mediating allergic reactions and inflammatory reactions. Uh, we talked about mast cells releasing histamine in response to allergic reaction. Uh, or in response to an antigen that stimulates them, and something else they do is release prostaglandins, uh, and one of them is prostaglandin D4. All right, to make prostaglandins, we take the arachidonic acid, and then the inflammatory prostaglandins that we talk about are made by something called the cyclooxygenase isoenzymes. Iso meaning subtypes of enzymes. And so you'll hear them called COX-1 and COX-2, and that COX stands for cyclooxygenase. And so when we have COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors, uh, they have anti-inflammatory properties for this reason right here. All right, so prostaglandins uh, that block COX-1 and COX-2 receptors, uh, they're going to be called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, anti-inflammatory being the key word here. And the non-steroidal meaning, uh, not the steroids that we're going to talk about. Uh, non-steroidal meaning not based on cortisone. Cortisone is our steroidal anti-inflammatory in the body, and then there's all sorts of synthetic forms as well. Uh, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are cyclooxygenase inhibitors. And so you'll hear the word NSAID used all the time. They use it on TV like people know what non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs actually stand for. Uh, and as if anyone knows that they're cyclooxygenase inhibitors uh, preventing uh, prostaglandin synthesis from arachidonic acid. But you know I ibuprofen, and, uh, which is Advil and Motrin, and naproxen is a nice non-steroidal anti-inflammatory as well, has a little bit longer onset of action and a little bit longer duration of action. Uh, naproxen and Aleve are forms of naproxen. So again, ibuprofen is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor of both, uh, both isoenzymes, uh, preventing prostaglandin synthesis, the prostaglandins that are involved in inflammation. That's why ibuprofen is listed as an anti-inflammatory agent, and ibuprofen is great at uh, decreasing inflammation and treating pain uh, that's due to inflammation or has an inflammatory component. All right, well, prostaglandins, not only do they mediate allergic reaction, but many of those prostaglandins are also involved in pain and fever. 
And so by blocking the cyclooxygenase enzyme, uh, we block prostaglandins that are involved in pain control. And so that's why things like ibuprofen and the nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories, not only do they have anti-inflammatory effect, but they have analgesic effects as well. Uh, they treat pain. Uh, they also have anti-pyrexia, anti against pyro as in fire. Uh, so anti-pyrexia is an anti-fever agent. And ibuprofen, uh, it has, it has good anti-pyrexic um, effects. Uh, however, due to all sorts of other things, uh, I think there are uh, better choices to use at first. All right, so because ibuprofen is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor preventing the formation of prostaglandins, specific prostaglandins that are formed from uh, the cyclooxygenase isoenzymes, ibuprofen, a nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory, has anti-inflammatory effects, analgesic effects, and antipyrexic effects. Um, prostaglandins also mediate the mucosal lining of the stomach. And this mucosal lining of the stomach is what protects the stomach from acid eating through it. If that mucosal lining, if that mucus layer, uh, if the mucus layer on the stomach was not there, uh, then the stomach acid would just eat through the stomach. And that's what happens with ulcers. And so nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can cause ulcers. Um, they put all sorts of coatings on it and say, oh, this protects you from ulcers. Uh, that protects the local effect, but still systemically, uh, Nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories can cause ulcers. And so this is a major cause of concern, especially in the elderly, when they have a lot of um, arthritis, arthralgia, joint pain, and other pains. We don't want them to be on a bunch of um, opiate analgesics uh, because they can increase their risk of fall and overly sedate them. And so we like to put them on nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, however, uh, as we age, that mucous lining uh, doesn't work so well. And so non anti-inflammatories are notorious for causing ulcers in the older population. All right, non anti-inflammatories, uh, I'm sorry, prostaglandins uh, also, and thromboxanes uh, mediate platelet activity. And so non anti-inflammatories can increase risk of bleeding. That's why they tell pregnant women before they deliver a baby, baby uh, not to take any kind of NSAID because of the in increased risk of bleeding. Uh, any kind of surgery procedure that people have, uh, sometimes they'll be given instructions not to take ibuprofen or other non anti-inflammatories uh, because it affects thromboxanes that affect platelet activity. And we talked a little bit about the thromboxanes uh, when we talked about blood clotting. And so non anti-inflammatories can cause bleeding, and that's primarily why I don't like to use ibuprofen as an anti uh, pyretic agent, especially in my own children, and I didn't like to use it much in a clinical setting unless I really, really, really had no choice. This is what I wanted to see. Uh, prostaglandins keep the ductus arteriosus open, so when a baby's developing, uh, they can't breathe air in and, out of, uh, in and out of their lungs, and so the blood basically has to bypass the lungs so that because the baby gets oxygenated blood from the umbilical cord and that goes up to the heart and then that needs to be pumped to the systemic circulation without going through the lungs first uh, because the lungs are closed uh, when you inhale that opens the blood vessels in your lungs and so when they're full of fluid uh, and not full of air uh, the blood vessels are basically uh, completely shut down and so rather than pump blood through the lungs uh, we have this thing called a ductus arteriosus babies have ductus arteriosus and that allows the blood uh, to skip the lungs, uh, the oxygenated blood from the mom to skip the lungs and go directly into the um, systemic vascular system. Then it's prostaglandins uh, that keep that open. And so if a baby has a PDA, if they're born, as soon as they take a big breath, their ductus arteriosus should close. Uh, and that's due to uh, prostaglandin regulation uh, involved in the lungs, and other, among other things. And so as soon as they take a breath, that ductus arteriosus uh, should at least start to close. And so when, that patent ductus when the ductus arteriosus stays open, that's called patent. When something stays open, it's called patent. That patent ductus arteriosus, uh, we can treat that, we can treat them with an IV form 
of ibuprofen. It's an ibuprofen salt uh, that is used IV, and so we can use that uh, to close a patent ductus arteriosus in infants. When my triplets were in the hospital, we had a big discussion about that. All right, well, aspirin is also considered a type of NSAID. Look, when you talk about nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories in a clinical situation, you're usually talking about ibuprofen and naproxen and those drugs that are in that class. All right, well, aspirin is considered a type of NSAID, uh, and so that's a technical term. I don't really like to call aspirin an NSAID, even though technically it is. Uh, but when we talk about the NSAIDs, we're talking about ibuprofen and um, we're talking about naproxen and the drugs that are related to that. All right, aspirin does have anti-inflammatory effects, anti-analgesic effects, anti-pyretic effects, and anti-platelet effects for all the reasons that we just got through talking about. It can cause ulcers as well. So uh, we do use it as an anti-platelet agent uh, because of its uh, inhibition in the formation of certain thromboxanes. Uh, we do not want to use it as an antipyretic anymore, especially in children, uh, because it can contribute to something called Reyes syndrome, R-E-Y-E-S is Reyes syndrome, and so we don't want to use aspirin uh, for anyone with a fever, especially children. Uh, it has, uh, aspirin is excellent for, uh, um, for oh, uh, post-streptococcal issues where somebody has a strep infection, and the, the antibodies that are fighting the strep start fighting the body as well. And so we'll see uh, aspirin used in its anti-inflammatory effects as that as well. Uh, but our, our primary use of aspirin is its antiplatelet effect. All right, here's a favorite trick question on boards and maybe a quiz. Uh, Tylenol, because it is, affects different prostaglandins, it does not have anti-inflammatory effects. So it is not an NSAID. Tylenol, acetaminophen, is not an NSAID. And, and people like to ask that for all sorts of technical reasons. Uh, so even though it is a prostaglandin synthesis, uh, synthesis inhibitor, it does not have, it does not affect the, regu the prostaglandins that are involved in inflammation. Uh, so it does have analgesic effects, and then it also has antipyretic effects. It has excellent antipyretic effects. It's an excellent anti-fever uh, agent. And so because it does not have um, effect on blood platelets, um, this is an excellent drug to use as an antipyretic in the first line in the treatment of fever. All right, this is a very important point uh, clinically for your patients. Uh, because your patients out there, especially from watching TV, um, they compare on TV, they compare ibuprofen with aspirin and Tylenol and aspirin and ibuprofen and Tylenol, and they're always comparing them as if they're one drug. And so somebody who you're trying to prevent the risk of a heart attack, and you'll say, um, yeah, we want you to take an aspirin every day or a baby aspirin every day, that'll be fine, but you can take an adult aspirin every day, and the dose is basically the same as a Tylenol. And so if you talk to your patients, it's like, do you take an aspirin every day? Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, great. That's great for preventing heart attack. Well, if you ask them a little bit more carefully, like what brand do you use? How much do you take? Did you bring the bottle with you? When I met my, with my patients, I always wanted them to bring the actual bottles unless I knew that they knew specifically what they were doing. And sometimes uh, you'll ask somebody to take an aspirin every day, and you're like, oh, well, the TV says Tylenol is better. And so they're supposed to be taking an aspirin every day uh, to prevent heart attack. And you're going to find out, gee whiz, they're taking acetaminophen every day uh, because the TV tells them it's a substitute. Or instead of taking an aspirin every day, they, they take an ibuprofen every day. And so patients, your patients, especially because of the marketing information on television, they think there's no difference between ibuprofen, aspirin, and Tylenol because they're constantly being compared to each other like they're all in the same class of drug, and each manufacturer swears it's so much better uh, than the other one. And you're going to find out that people who are supposed to be taking one thing or another thing are taking something else entirely. And so it's very important to ask, especially when you're asking people, do you, do you take an aspirin every day? What does it look like? Who manufactured it? Do you know the name that's on the bottle? Uh, because trade names can mean anything. And so you might come across somebody who's taking acetaminophen every day uh, when they think they're supposed to be taking an aspirin every day.
Right, and again, acetaminophen, Tylenol, does not have anti-inflammatory properties, it does not have antiplatelet activity, and it does not cause ulcers because it's involved in a different prostaglandin uh, pathway. It's a different set of enzymes that it's an inhibitor of. Um, acetaminophen in excessive doses can be toxic to the liver. Your liver is able to metabolize acetaminophen, Tylenol, just fine unless the person has liver disease. Uh, but a normal liver can, do, uh, can deal with normal doses of Tylenol um, on a regular basis. However, if people take excessive doses of Tylenol, uh, then that can be hepatotoxic. Uh, one of the reasons we see hepatotoxicity with acetaminophen use is when the acetaminophen is mixed with an opiate analgesic. And so like Percocet and, and um, Vicodin, uh, those are opiates that are mixed with Tylenol and people will take so much of them that they start to become hepatotoxic um, from the acetaminophen that's in their pain medications and then they don't know that they can't be taking Tylenol on the side as well. And so you'll see people who take maximum doses of Tylenol and then they take uh, uh, analgesic agents uh, that are full of acetaminophen and they can become hepatotoxic. Um, acetylcysteine is something that we use as a mucolytic when it's inhaled. Uh, we can use it in the emergency treatment of acetaminophen as well. And so this is something that you want to know. And we talked about that. If you look at the syllabus and look at a good drug description, a good drug description uh, will tell you the, uh, the pharmacology, uh, the dynamics. They'll also tell you the metabolism, the kinetics, usual dosage, its indications, what it's used for, its contraindications, what you want to avoid, warnings, and something a good drug description will always tell you is what to do in case of an overdose, you know, besides called poison control. All right, well, this was an interesting slide uh, I right-clicked on and photoshopped. Uh, but anyway, this is an icosahedron. We'll see it again when we talk about viruses. It's a set of triangles. It's a set of 20 triangles that fit together in this nice little ball. And so that's where this icosa word, sometimes it's spelled like this, sometimes it's spelled like that, but icosahedrons have 20. Uh, that's where that icosa 20 comes from. And so that's why the prostaglandins, prostacyclines, the thromboxanes, and the leukotrienes, they're referred to as icosanoids. I've seen books that refer to the prostacyclines, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. Uh, well, those are all just prostaglandins. So clinically, uh, we call the prostaglandins, the prostacyclines, and the thromboxanes, and the leukotrienes. We call them forms of prostaglandins, and that's fine uh, from a clinical point of view. But technically, in pharmacology, we call them all icosanoids. Uh, because they're all they all have 20 carbons and they're all synthesized from arachidonic acid. <clears throat> so something I want you to walk away with is what this word means. Because if you read uh, books written by people who know what they're writing, uh, you'll know that the prostaglandins, prostacyclines, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes are all forms of icosanoids. Leuco, as in white blood cell, triene. Triene means three double bonds. That's what. Uh, leukotriene stands for three double bonds in a row, uh, makes it a triene. And so we're going to talk about leukotriene A4 uh, when we get to asthma. And monoleucas singular is a leukotriene a receptor antagonist that's used in asthma. And, and we'll talk about this when we talk about asthma. All right, that's more than enough for this lecture. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about gastrointestinal pharmacology, and we're going to talk about asthma as well. So until then, aloha.